Marco Bertini, marketing professor at Barcelona's ESEAD Business School. And Marco also held a VIP session earlier today for some of the VIPs and speakers. And let's see if we can have him here and talk a bit about setting price and uh, other models of what he calls the ends, the end game, how technology is revolutionizing the basis of commerce. And what one could think about is how is exponential technology having an impact on commerce? Marco Bertini, you come fresh off the stage of having Indeed. a VIP session. Indeed. Now, I don't think our online viewers had a chance to <laughs> view the VIP session, so can you just give some key takeaways that you think would be of value for them? So the, uh, the session was a session ultimately about technology mm -hmm. um, and how technology is changing the very nature or the very fiber of commerce. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, uh, we have exchange with customers, and as a firm, we're typically used to selling them things, right? We're we used to selling them products, we're used to selling them services. Uh, and it's fine for us because, we you know, the risk is on the customer. If it doesn't perform, so be it, right? You bought it, right? Maybe there's a guarantee in place. But um, the technology bit is that, increasingly, we're able to actually understand consumption, which we couldn't do before. We left the product with the customer, and that's it. We didn't know what was happening. But now we have sensors. And these sensors can tell us how consumption, when consumption is happening, how it's happening, and it can even tell you the outcomes of that consumption. So when you've got that opportunity, I was telling the audience, the market is much more efficient because you've got a customer that wants something and it can maybe be charged only for that something. That's as efficient as it gets. So when you have this, this opportunity, this efficiency, I was telling my audience, that's an opportunity to grow your market, to, to get more revenue, to lower your costs. Flip the, the knife over, the other side of the knife was, or the sword, is the opportunity is there. If you don't take it, somebody else will, for sure. So you have to be kind of careful. Yeah, it's always... And, mm -hmm. Go on. So I was just saying that then I, in the presentation, I showed them examples from anything from uh, industrial explosives to comedy theaters to healthcare to education. All of these markets are moving at a pretty steady state towards those uh, outcome-based models. Mm. And, and I know, which you also mentioned, you specialize in pricing, right. and you've also stated that there are only four ingredients that matter when setting a price. Yes. So which are these four? Absolutely. So when you're setting a price, uh, it's actually, it's pretty easy to understand what they are. I call them the four Cs. Uh, costs, competition, customers, and your company goals. Mm. So typically what I, would, what I would talk about is how these ingredients are logical, and you understand, and we kind of use them in some way. Mm where the problems arise is at the moment of actually integrating that information. Mm. So for example, we rely way too much on our costs when we price something. We don't rely way enough on our customers when we price something. We think way too much about our competition. We like agonize over, we have like voodoo dolls and we, you know, we agonize about competitors. No, don't do that. Uh, and we're often in conflict with, with, between ourselves in the company as to what the objectives actually are. Mm. So, Finding a way to integrate an information properly is kind of the secret sauce there. And you also, I know that you pointed out that generating revenue is as much about creativity and strategy yes. as it is about dollars and coins. Right. Yes. So, so exemplify yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I say that is because, from the one hand, um, at most organizations that I've had the pleasure to work with, they tend to um, see pricing as a very tactical thing. Mm -hmm. Me as a psychologist by training, I see prices as lots of meaning. Mm -hmm. So they have, they're of course numbers, but they're also information. We learn, you learn, I learn a lot from prices in the marketplace. What is the quality? Mm -hmm. What is the company trying to tell me? Mm -hmm. And also price, the way we price can set certain relationships with customers. So the moment you know that a price has this kind of impact on customers, it becomes, it moves from being a short term, let me capture money from them, tactical thing to, uh, hold on a second, long term, let me manage demand over time. Mm. What do I want to tell my customers about my brand? Mm. What kind of relationships do I want? And the moment you start using it that way, it becomes strategy mm. and it becomes creativity and it ensures that your demand is sustainable uh, over time.
And, and looking at sort of the whole marketing spectrum, I mean, today we, we talk more about gaining a fan or, or someone who really, you know, endorses the brand as opposed to just gaining a conversion. So, so what, what are sort of the metrics that, that are coming more to really get a brand to be positioned to a target group and not just to have a conversion for them? From, a, from my perspective, yeah. Well, so, okay, so it's a bit of an intricate question, as you ask. So there, there, ultimately, a company has two sort of aspects when it, com when it comes to its customers. It has the creation of value perspective, right, mm -hmm. where the branding comes into it, mm -hmm. and then it has the capturing of value perspective, where we try to convert that into revenue, mm -hmm. right? What we fail to do properly is measure, is integrate those two things. Mm -hmm. When we don't integrate those two things properly, you have this problem that you're mentioning, mm -hmm. okay? So the metrics that you want to think about are things like customer lifetime value. So what is the value of your customer exactly. and your brand over time as opposed to short-term metrics? Mm -hmm. um, and also sometimes the more softer measures about beliefs and attitudes of your customers because those fuel the brand uh, over time. And, and how is technology, especially exponential technology with AI, with VR, you talked about sensors and so yes. forth, how is that sort of coming to revolutionize or impact My world? You know, the basis of com commerce and yeah. your role? Um, so the way I, I think about it is, is I start narrow and I, get, and I get broad. So if you think about technology, technology in commerce is transparency. Yeah. Right? Ultimately, to me, it's transparency. That transparency then becomes different things it becomes um, accountability, which is what I was talking about before. Mm. Uh, if it's transparent in my exchange with you, I need to be more accountable. If I tell you I'm gonna give you X, why am I not, if I'm a customer, why am I not paying for X? Mm. Why am I paying for anything but X, right? Mm. So the accountability comes into it. Um, automation. Mm. I can understand my competitor's prices instantly, and I couldn't do so before. Mm. By the way, if I want to, I can also have robots do my competitive bidding against competitors mm. at the same time. So automation is changing a little bit the way we approach the, pro the, the, the process. Um, it is changing also fundamentally decision making, mm. right? Uh, especially a topic like mine, it's full of heuristics and biases, right? It's full of, because it's hard to understand, you know, numbers and Excel spreadsheets. Uh, so we tend to resort to heuristics. With, with lots of technology and lots of transparency, you can replace that heuristics with some more proper decision rules. Mm. And do you see anything, because today also if you look within commerce, it's going so much more from offline to online, of course. Right. And, and how do you see that transition? What, what do you think, are they going to um, weigh in on each other or is one going to exclude the other? Um, I would like to know that. Uh, I don't know. I, th I think as a marketing professor, I suppose, my, my, my standard is always the customer. Mm. Um, the offline-online dichotomy has changed a lot over time. It used to be the case that we're offline, we go online, but we tell the customer what to do. Mm. No, you look there, but you buy here, right? And you don't pay more here, you pay more here, right? Things like this. Um, but of course, the customer says, no, 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 I want to have my journey, my experience, the way I want it. And the customer always wins because the customer has the money. If they don't win here, they go somewhere else. And so companies have started doing this omni-channel idea where you try to integrate all of these channels into one, into one uh, experience. The pricing angle of it has been one of the last ones to change because companies are very, very hesitant. They're always asking me, for example, one of the big questions is, what should I do with my online prices? Should it be the same as offline? And the long answer to your question is, uh, it, the, the relative weight of these things will depend ultimately on the customer journey itself. Mm. But whatever the customer feels comfortable with, um, that is the best way to structure the journey. And maybe that offline is more, exp it's an experience that you create and online is maybe more the purchase. I, well, it can, I don't know, it, can, it could be, it definitely could be. It can also be functional, right? We've seen recently um, in the retail sector, for example, companies saying, yes, yes, shop online, get your security online, compare online. But by the way, if you buy online, you're not getting the product today. And it's if you want, that's very functional, right? If you want the thing now, go to my store and get it. So you can see how, it really depends on the nature of that experience, in my opinion. And with your know-how, what would you say are the three key future marketing trends that we can see, let's say, in three to five years, because everything goes so quickly now? So, uh, with, 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 with permission, I would like to uh, list one of the things that I talk about as, yeah. as one of those trends. So, to me, the, the clearer trend is this change in the way we generate revenue, as I was mentioning to the audience, between uh, ownership to outcomes. 
it's, it's, to me, it's perfectly clear, and I see it in all, in all sorts of marketplaces. That would be number one, one of the three. Um, another one, I think, is um, the use of analytics. Is just, I mean, it's cliche almost to say it by now, but it's, but it's, I mean, when you're there, you see it, it's completely revolutionizing the way organizations work. Even I work for a business school, so even how business schools work, um, the functions within companies, disciplines within business schools are basically merging into one, right? Um, and then number three, I think, also fueled by technology is the, is the sheer efficiency mm. that it's creating on the, on the operation side, mm. uh, the ability to make your, uh, your company run as, as smooth as it possibly can. And I was also thinking coming to pricing, because I think this was also a question that, that someone in the audience wanted me to address to you. And that was sort of a question on, on discounting. How do you sort of discount intelligently um, from a long-term long point right. of view? So, um, there's a few things you want to do. So this, I think the very first thing you want to do, with discounting, it's, it's a very tricky animal. Mm. Um, discounting, most of us as companies go into it because we feel we have to. Uh, we kind of would like to stop, but once you get in that cycle, it's like a, you know, like a prisoner's dilemma. It's very hard to get out of it, right? So it's a bit of a love-hate relationship. So with discounting, what you want to do is you don't want to stop. You don't want to do too much of it. What you want to do is you get essentially, and it's kind of logical to say this, mm. you want to get the biggest bang for your buck. Of course. Right? So now, logical to say, in practice, what this means is that if I'm going to do some discounting, I don't want to stop at, did the customer buy me because of the discount? I want to do something else with it. Mm. It's an opportunity, for example, depending on the sector, to build my brand. Mm. I have the customer's attention because the, the discount attracted them to me. Well, okay, how do I structure the discount in such a way that actually reinforces the behaviors that are consistent with my brand? Mm. Um, so, for example, an example that comes to mind, if I, uh, if I sell health insurance and, wanna, and I want to do some discounts to grow my marketplace, don't just give money, people to, money to people. Uh, maybe make them give a discount conditional on them running more, walking more, eating apples, whatever it might be. That's consistent with my brand, right? I want people to live a healthier life. I reward you. Instead of discount, I reward you for living a healthier life. So you sort of change the incentive. You change the narrative, yeah, yeah. in a sense. Which is so right. important. Right. And are there any challenges that you find are easy um, to shift into solutions, just quickly before we end, that you would like to convey? Um, to a few challenges, uh, data being one of them. If you don't have data to start with, you mm. cannot do anything, okay? No. Uh, about consumption patterns. Uh, another big one is getting over yourself. Uh, so, uh, it, what I mean by that, and I, I, called, I talked about this in the session, I, yeah. I called it the quality paradox. Um, paradoxically, the companies who, who are better at creating value, they innovate more, they spend on R&D, they're really into, they're actually the least likely at the moment to look, think about outcomes because there's so much in their heads in the about house. their products and services, how great their pills are, how great their televisions are. And so, and so it's very hard for them to empathize with customers, one. And two, because they've spent so much money, they tend to be much more conservative. Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure they recover their costs, so they're very much inward looking. So that's a big challenge for me. That's a big challenge. Big topic. Big topic. And what are you most looking forward to today? Any speakers? Uh, listen to the other speakers. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I know my, uh, my speech and yeah. my message, and I, I try to convey it as best as possible, but I mean, the lineup here is, is great. I'm looking forward to listening to them and the quality of the audience and their comments. Well, sure. Marco Bertini, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your insights, and thank the you best of luck going forward. And do come back and join us of next course. time. Of course. Thank you for having me.